This is a collection of lectures by, excuse me, a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Kingdom of Childhood. This is lecture one given in Torquay on August 12, 1924. My dear friends, it gives me the deepest satisfaction to find here in England that you are ready to consider founding a school based on anthroposophical ideas. This may be a truly momentous and incisive event in the history of education. Such words could well be heard as expressing lack of humility, but what will come about for education through an art of education based on anthroposophy is something quite special, and I am overjoyed that an impulse has arisen to form the first beginnings of a college of teachers, teachers who from the very depths of their hearts do indeed recognize the very special quality of what we call anthroposophical education. It is no fanatical idea of reform that prompts us to speak of a renewal in educational life. We are urged to do so out of our whole feeling and experience of how humankind is evolving in civilization and in cultural life. In speaking thus, we are fully aware of the immense amount that has been done for education by distinguished individuals in the course of the nineteenth century, and especially in the last few decades. But although this was undertaken with the very best intentions, and every possible method was tried, a real knowledge of the human being has been lacking. These ideas about education arose at a time when no real knowledge of the human being was possible because of the materialism that prevailed in all aspects of life and indeed had done so since the fifteenth century. Therefore, when people expounded their ideas on educational reform, they were building on sand or on something le even less stable. Rules of education were laid down based on all sorts of emotions and opinions of what life ought to be. It was impossible to know the wholeness of the human being and to ask the question, how can we bring to light in people what lies, God-given, within their nature after they have descended from pre-earthly life into earthly life? This is the kind of question that can be raised in an abstract way, but can only be answered concretely on the basis of a true knowledge of the human being in body, soul, and spirit. Now this is how the matter stands for present-day humanity. The knowledge of the body is highly developed. By means of biology, physiology, and anatomy, a very advanced knowledge of the human body has been acquired. But as soon as we wish to acquire a knowledge of the soul, we, with our present-day views, are confronted with a complete impasse, for everything relating to the soul is merely a name, a word. Even for such things as thinking, feeling, and willing, we find no reality in the ordinary psychology of today. We still use the words thinking, feeling, and willing, but there is no conception of what takes place in the soul in reference to these things. What the so-called psychologists have to say about thinking, feeling, and willing is in reality mere dilettantism. It is just as though a physiologist were to speak in a general way of the human lungs or liver, making no distinction between the liver of a child and that of an old person. We are advanced in the science of the body. No physiologist would fail to note the difference between the lungs of a child and the lungs of an old man, or indeed between the hair of a child and the hair of an old man. A physiologist would note all these differences. But thinking, feeling, and willing are mere words that are uttered without conveying any sense of reality. For instance, it is not known that willing, as it appears in the soul, is young, while thinking is old. That, in fact, thinking is willing grown old. And willing is a youthful thinking in the soul. Thus everything that pertains to the soul contains youthfulness and old age.
both existing in human beings simultaneously. Even in the soul of a young child there is the old thinking and the young willing together at the same time. Indeed, these things are realities. But today no one knows how to speak of these realities of the soul in the same way the realities of the body are spoken of, so that as teachers of children we are quite helpless. Suppose you were a physician and yet were unable to distinguish between a child and an old man. You would, of course, feel helpless. But since there is no science of the soul, the teacher is unable to speak about the human soul as the modern physician can of the human body. And as for the spirit, there is no such thing. One cannot speak of it. There are no longer even any words for it. There is but the single word spirit, and that does not convey much. There are no other words to describe it. In our present day life, we cannot therefore venture to speak of a knowledge of the human being. Here we may easily feel that all is not well with our education, and that certain things must be improved upon. Yes, but how can we improve matters if we know nothing at all of the human being? Therefore all the ideas for improving education may be inspired by the best will in the world but they possess no knowledge of the human being. This can be noticed even in our own circles, for today it is anthroposophy that can help us to acquire this knowledge of human beings. I am not saying this from any sectarian or fanatical standpoint, but it is true that one who seeks knowledge of the human being must find it in anthroposophy. It is obvious that knowledge of the human being must be the basis for a teacher's work. That being so, teachers must acquire this knowledge for themselves, and the natural thing will be that they acquire it through anthroposophy. If, therefore, we are asked what the basis of a new method of education should be, our answer is, anthroposophy must be that basis. But how many people there are, even in our own circles, who try to disclaim anthroposophy as much as possible and to propagate an education without letting it be known that anthroposophy is behind it. An old German proverb says, Please wash me, but don't make me wet. Many projects are undertaken in this spirit, but you must, above all, both speak and think truthfully. So if anyone asks you how to become a good teacher, you must say, make anthroposophy your foundation. You must not deny anthroposophy, for only by this means can you acquire your knowledge of the human being. There is no knowledge of the human being in our present cultural life. There are theories, but no living insights, either into the world, life, or people. A true insight will lead to a true practice in life, but there is no such practical life today. Do you know who are the most unpractical people at the present time? It is not the scientists, for although they are awkward and ignorant of life, these faults can be seen clearly in them. But these things are not observed in those who truly are the worst theorists and who are the least practical in life. They are the so-called practical people, the business and industry people and bankers, those who rule the practical affairs of life with theoretical thoughts. A bank today is entirely composed of thoughts arising from theories. There is nothing practical in it. But people do not notice this, for they say, it must be so, that is the way practical people work. So they adapt themselves to it, and no one notices the harm that is really being done in life, because it is all worked in such an unpractical way. The quote-unquote practical life of today is absolutely unpractical in all its forms. This will be noticed only when an ever-increasing number of destructive elements enter our civilization and break it up. If this goes on, the world war will have been nothing but a first step, an introduction. 
In reality, the world war arose out of this unpractical thinking, but that was only an introduction. The point now at stake is that people should not remain asleep any longer, particularly in teaching and education. Our task is to introduce an education that concerns itself with the whole person, body, soul, and spirit, and these three principles will become known and recognized. In the short course that is to be given here, I can speak only of the most important aspects of body, soul, and spirit in such a way that it will give a direction to education and teaching. That is what I shall do. But the first requirement, as will be seen from the start, is that my listeners must really try to direct their observation, even externally, to the whole human being. How are the basic principles of education determined these days? The child is observed, and then you are told the child is like this or like that and must learn something. Then it is thought how best to teach, so that the child can learn such and such a thing quickly. But what in reality is a child? A child remains a child for at most twelve years, or possibly longer, but that is not the point. The point is that a child must always be thought of as becoming a grown-up person some day. Life as a whole is a unity, and you must not consider only the child, but the whole of life. You must look at the whole human being. Suppose I have a pale child in the school. A pale child should be an enigma to me, a riddle to be solved. There may be several reasons for the pallor, but the following is a possible one. The child may have come to school with somewhat rosy cheeks, and my treatment of the child may have caused the pallor. I must admit this and be able to judge the causes of the change of color. I may perhaps come to see that I have given this child too much to learn by heart. The memory may have been worked too hard. If I do not admit this possibility, if I am a short-sighted teacher with the idea that a method must be carried through regardless of whether the child grows rosy or pale thereby, that the method must be preserved at any cost, then the child will remain pale. If, however, I observed this same child at the age of fifty, I would probably find terrible sclerosis or arterial hardening, the cause of which would be unknown. This is the result of my having overloaded the child's memory at the age of eight or nine. For you see, the adult of fifty and the child of eight or nine belong together. They are one and the same human being. I must know what the result will be forty or fifty years later of my management of the child. For life is a unity. It is all connected. It is not enough merely to know the child. I must know the whole human being. Again, I take great trouble to give a class the best definitions I can, so that the concepts can be firmly grasped and the children will know this is a lion, that is a cat and so on. But should children retain these concepts to the day of their death? In our present age there is no feeling for the fact that the soul too must grow. If I furnish a child with a concept that is to, that is to remain quote-unquote correct, parenthesis and correctness is of course all that matters, exclamation, close parenthesis, a concept to be retained throughout life it is just as though I bought the child a pair of shoes at the age of three and each successive year had shoes made of the same size. The child will grow out of them. This, however, is something that people notice and it would be considered brutal to try and keep the child's feet small enough to go on wearing the, the same sized shoes. Yet this is what is being done with the soul when I furnish the child with ideas that do not grow with the person. I am constantly squeezing the soul into the ideas I give the child when I give concepts that are intended to be permanent, when I worry the child with fixed, unchangeable concepts instead of giving the child concepts capable of expansion. 
These are some of the ways in which you may begin to answer the challenge that in education you must take the whole human being into consideration, the growing, living human being, and not just an abstract idea. It is only when you have the right conception of human life as a connected whole that you come to realize how different from each other the various ages are. Children before the first teeth are shed are very different beings from what they become afterward. Of course, you must not interpret this in crudely formed judgments, but if you are capable of making finer distinctions in life, you can observe that children are quite different before and after the change of teeth. Before the change of teeth, you can still see quite clearly, at work, the effects of the child's habits of life before birth or conception in its pre-earthly existence in the spiritual world. The body of the child acts almost as though it were spirit, for the spirit that has descended from the spiritual world is still fully active in a child in the first seven years of life. You will say, a fine sort of spirit, it has become quite boisterous, for the child is rampageous, awkward and incompetent. Is all this to be attributed to the spirit belonging to its pre-earthly life? Well, my dear friends, suppose all you clever and well-brought-up people were suddenly condemned to remain always in a room having a temperature of 144 degrees Fahrenheit. You couldn't do it. It is even harder for the spirit of the child, which has descended from the spiritual worlds, to accustom itself to earthly conditions. The spirit, suddenly transported into a completely different world with the new experience of having a body to carry about, acts as we see the child act. Yet if you know how to observe and note how each day, each week, each month, the indefinite features of the face become more definite, the awkward movements become less clumsy, and the child gradually accustoms itself to its surroundings, then you will realize that it is the spirit from the pre-earthly world that is working to make the child's body gradually more like itself. We shall understand why the child is as it is. If we observe the child in this way, we shall also understand it is the descended spirit that is acting as we see it within the child's body. Therefore, for someone who knows the mysteries of the spirit, it is both wonderful and delightful to observe a little child. In doing so, one learns not of the earth, but of heaven. In so-called good children, as a rule, their bodies have already become heavy, even in infancy, and the spirit cannot properly take hold of the body. Such children are quiet, they do not scream and rush about. They sit still and make no noise. The spirit is not active within them because their bodies offer such resistance. It is often the case that the bodies of so-called good children offer resistance to the spirit. In the less well-behaved children who make a great deal of healthy noise, who shout properly and give a lot of trouble, the spirit is active though, of course, in a clumsy way, for it has been transported from heaven to earth. But the spirit is active within them. It is making use of the body. You may even regard the wild screams of a child as most enthralling, simply because you thereby experience the martyrdom the spirit had, has to endure when it descends into a child body. Yes, my dear friends, it is easy to be a grown-up person, easy for the spirit, I mean, because the body has then been made ready. It no longer offers the same resistance. It is quite easy to be a full-grown person, but extremely difficult to be a child. The child itself is not aware of this, because consciousness is not yet awake. It is still asleep, but if the child possessed the consciousness it had before descending to earth, it would soon notice this difficulty. If the child were still living in this pre-earthly consciousness, its life would be a terrible tragedy, a really terrible tragedy. 
For you see, the child comes down to earth. Before this, it has been accustomed to a spiritual substance from which it drew its spiritual life. The child was accustomed to deal with that spiritual substance. It had prepared itself according to its karma, according to the result of previous lives. It was fully contained within its own spiritual garment, as it were. Now it has to descend to earth. I should like to speak quite simply about these things, and you must excuse me if I speak of them as I would if I were describing the ordinary things of the earth. I can speak of them thus because they are so. Now, when a human being is to descend, a body must be chosen on the earth. And, indeed, this body has been prepared throughout generations. Some father and mother had a son or a daughter, and there, again, a son or a daughter, and so on. Thus, through heredity, a body is produced that must now be occupied. The spirit must draw into it and dwell in it. But in so doing, it is suddenly faced with quite different conditions. It clothes itself in a body that has been prepared by a number of generations. Of course, even from the spiritual world, the human being can work on the body so that it may not be altogether unsuitable. Yet, as a rule, the body received is not so very suitable after all. For the most part, a soul does not fit at all easily into such a body. If a glove were to fit your hand as badly as the body generally fits the soul, you would discard it at once. You would never think of putting it on. But when you come down from the spiritual world, needing a body, you just have to take one, and you keep this body until the change of teeth. For it is a fact that every seven or eight years our physical, our external physical substance is completely changed, at least in the essentials, though not in all respects. Our first teeth, for instance, are changed. The second set remain. This is not the case with all the members of the human organism. Some parts, even more important than the teeth, undergo change every seven years, as long as a person is on the earth. If the teeth were to behave in the same way as these, we should have new teeth at seven, fourteen, and again at twenty-one years of age, and so on, and there would be no dentists in the world. Thus, certain hard organs remain, but the softer ones are constantly being renewed. In the first seven years of our life, we have a body that is given to us by outer nature, by our parents, and so on. It is a model. The soul occupies the same relation to this body as an artist to a model that he has to copy. We gradually shape the second body out of the first body up to the change of teeth. It takes seven years to complete the process. This second body that we ourselves have fashioned on the model given us by our parents only appears at the end of the first seven years of life and all that external science says today about heredity and so forth is mere dilettantism compared to the reality. In reality we receive at birth a model body that is with us for seven years, although during the first, very first years of it life it begins to die out and fall away. The process continues until at the change of teeth we have our second body. Now, there are weak individualities who are weakly when they descend to earth. These form their second body in which they will live after the change of teeth as an exact copy of the first one. People say that they take after their parents by inheritance, but this is not true. They make their own second body according to the inherited model. It is only during our first seven years of life that the body is really inherited. But naturally, many are weak individualities and copy a great deal. There are also strong individualities descending to earth, and they too inherit a good deal in the first seven years, which can be observed in their teeth. The first teeth are still soft and subject to heredity, but when they are strong individualities, developing in the proper way, these children will have good, strong second teeth. 
There are children who at ten years of age are just like children of four, mere imitators. Others are quite different. Strong individuality stirs within them. The model is used, but afterward they form an individual body for themselves. Such things must be noted. All talk of heredity will not lead you far unless you realize how matters stand. Heredity, in the sense that it is spoken of by science, only applies to the first seven years of a person's life. After that age, whatever we inherit is inherited of our own free will, we might say. We imitate the model, but in reality the inherited part is thrown off with the first body at the change of teeth. The soul nature that comes down from the spiritual world is very strong in us, and it is clumsy at first, because it has to become accustomed to external nature. Yet in reality everything about a child, even the worst naughtiness, is very fascinating. Of course we must follow the conventions to some extent and not allow all naughtiness to pass unreproved, but we can see better in children than anywhere else how the spirit of the human being is tormented by the demons of degeneracy that are present in the world. The child has to enter a world into which it so often does not fit. If you were conscious of this process, you would see how terribly tragic it is. When you know something of initiation and are able to consciously observe what lays hold of the child's body, it really is terrible to see how the child must find a way into all the complications of bones and ligaments that have, that have to be formed. It really is a tragic sight. The child knows nothing of this, for the guardian of the threshold protects the child from any such knowledge. But teachers should be aware of it and look on with the deepest reverence knowing that here a being whose nature is of God and the Spirit has descended to earth. The essential thing is that you should know this, that you should fill your hearts with this knowledge and from this starting point undertake your work as educators. There are great differences between the manner of human being that a person is in the spiritual soul life before descending to, the, to earth and that which a person has to become here below. Teachers should be able to judge this, because standing before them is the child in whom are the after-effects of the spiritual world. Now, there is one thing that the child has difficulty in acquiring, because the soul had nothing of this in the spiritual life. On earth, human beings have little ability to direct their attention to the inner part of the body. That is only done by the natural scientists and the physicians. They know exactly what goes on inside a person within the limits of the skin. But you will find that most people do not even know exactly where their heart is. They generally point to the wrong place, and if in the course of social life today a person was asked to explain the difference between the lobes of the right and left lungs, or to describe the duodenum, very curious answers would be given. Now before we come down into earthly life, we take little interest in the external world, but we take much more interest in what may be called our spiritual inner being. In the life between death and a new birth, our interest is almost entirely centered on our inner spiritual life. We build up our karma in accordance with experiences from previous earth lives, and this we develop according to our inner life of spirit. The interest that we take in it is far removed from any earthly quality, very far removed from that longing for knowledge that, in its one-sided form, may be called inquisitiveness. A longing for knowledge, curiosity, a passionate desire for knowledge of the external life was not ours before our birth or descent to earth. We did not know it at all. That is why the young child has it only in so slight a degree. What we do experience, on the other hand, is to live right in and with our environment. 
Before descending to earth we live entirely in the outer world. The whole world is then our inner being, and there exist no such distinctions as outer and inner world. Therefore we are not curious about what is external, for that is all within us. We have no curiosity about it, we bear it within us, and it is an obvious and natural thing that we experience. So, in the first seven years of life, a child learns to walk, to speak, and to think out of the same manner of living it had before descending to earth. If you try to arouse curiosity in a child about some particular word, you will find that you thereby entirely drive out the child's wish to learn that word. If you count on a longing for knowledge or curiosity, you drive out just what the child ought to have. You must not reckon on a child's curiosity, but rather on something else, namely that the child becomes merged into you, as it were, and you really live in the child. All that the child enjoys must live and be as though it were the child's own inner nature. You must make the same impression on the child as its own arm makes. You must, so to say, be only the continuation of its own body. Then later, when the child has passed through the change of teeth and gradually enters the period between seven and fourteen years old, you must observe how little by little curiosity and a longing for knowledge begin to show themselves. You must be tactful and careful and pay attention to the way in which curiosity gradually stirs into being within the child. The small child is still only a clumsy little creature who does not ask questions and who can only make an impression by being something yourself. Excuse me, and you can only make an impression by being something yourself. A child questions the environment as little as a sack of flour. But just as a sack of flour will retain any impressions you make upon it, especially if it is well ground, so too does the little child retain impressions, not because the child is curious, but because you yourself are really one with the child and make impressions as you do with your fingers on a sack of flour. It is only at the change of teeth that the situation alters. You must notice the way the child now begins to ask questions. Quote, what is that? What do the stars see with? Why are the stars in the sky? Why have you a crooked nose, grandmother? The child now asks all kinds of questions and begins to be curious about surrounding things. You must have a delicate perception and note the gradual beginnings of curiosity and attention that appear with the second teeth. These are the years when these qualities appear, and you must be ready to meet them. You must allow the child's inner nature to decide what you ought to be doing. I mean, you must take the keenest interest in what is awakening with the change of teeth. A very great deal is awakening, then. The child is curious, but not with an intellectual curiosity, for as yet the child has no reasoning powers, and anyone who tries to appeal to the intellect of a child of seven is quite on the wrong lines. The child has fantasy, and this fantasy is what we must engage. It is really a question of developing the concept of a kind of, quote, milk of the soul, close quote. For you see, after birth, the child must be given bodily milk. This constitutes its food, and every other necessary substance is contained in the milk that the child consumes. And when children come to school, at the age of the changing of the teeth, it is again milk that you must give them, but now milk for the soul. That is to say, your teaching must not be made up of isolated units, but all that the children receive must be a unity after the change of teeth, children must have soul milk. If they are taught to read and write as two separate things, it is just as though their milk were to be separated chemically into two different parts, and you gave them one part at one time and the other at another. Reading and writing must form a unity. You must bring this idea of soul milk into being for your work with the children, 
when they first come to school. This can only come about if after the change of teeth the children's education is directed artistically. The artistic element must be in it all. Tomorrow I will describe more fully how to develop writing out of painting and thus give it an artistic form, and how you must then lead this over artistically to the teaching of reading, and how this artistic treatment of reading and writing must be connected again by artistic means with the first simple beginnings of arithmetic. All this must thus form a unity. You must gradually develop such things as soul milk for the children when they come to school. And when children reach the age of puberty, they will require a spiritual milk. This is extremely difficult to give to present-day humanity, for there is no spirit left in our materialistic age. It will be a difficult task to create spiritual milk. But if you do not succeed in creating it yourselves, your boys and girls will be left to themselves during the difficult adolescent years, for there is otherwise no spiritual milk in our present age. I just wanted to say these things by way of introduction and to give you a certain direction of thought. Tomorrow we will continue these considerations and go more into details. The End of Lecture 1